Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about pharmaceuticals with our guest, Dana Brown, the Director of Health and Economy at the Democracy Collaborative, where her research focuses on health and care systems, the pharmaceutical sector, and economic transformation for health and well-being. Dana Brown, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on and for the work you're doing. You recently co-authored an article called Public Pharma is the Best Solution to the Ongoing Problem of Drug Shortages. I'm, I guess I'm privileged to say I don't take any medicines and didn't know. Uh, do we have horrible drug shortages in the United States and are they worse than in other places? Uh, that's a great question. Well, drug shortages have been an ongoing problem in the United States for many years. And this year in particular, there's a real critical shortage of uh, cancer medications and a few others. There are medications for ADHD and a few other very common diseases that people are just having a lot of trouble getting their hands on. Um, and the issue this time really seems to be that we're dependent on cheap generic drugs for a lot of these diseases. And in the generic industry, the profit margins are pretty low. And with for-profit pharmaceuticals, profit is the main incentive. Uh, and when profit margins are low, then you kind of have to do everything that you can to minimize your costs. And so there's an incentive to cut corners and quality can sometimes suffer. So what happened in this case and what has happened routinely in the past uh, is that there'll be a quality issue in manufacturing and the FDA will say, mm, these drugs aren't good enough to, to come onto the market in the United States. You have to stop production until you can fix this error. Uh, and we're dependent on a few providers for a huge amount of these medications. So when one system goes down, that's it. We're in a shortage and it's critical. So this shortage in cancer medications has been critical since last fall. And that's really a problem for patients and providers across the nation who are having to make agonizing decisions about delaying treatment or taking second best drugs uh, or foregoing treatment altogether. So if, if you've got two or three corporations you're depending on for this, it wouldn't be that dramatically different to have one government you were depending on, right? It wouldn't be going from 150 competing companies to one government. It would be going from two giant companies to one government. Am I right? Well, sure. And also, I mean, most proposals for public pharma don't say that the government should supplant all private industry, but rather there's no reason that the government shouldn't also be producing medications, particularly what we call essential medicines. So medicines that are needed to treat diseases that are very common, that are big public health threats. Um, a, so medicines that we as a society need, right? A, those could be provided by the government and often are throughout the world and even in American history, lots of public producers, whether that's public health labs at the level of a city or a state or the whole nation. Um, a lot of times the government has seen that it's just essential for a functioning society that we have things like vaccines and antitoxins and antibiotics. And so they just made them themselves and distributed them because there's a need there. There's a social need and we can meet that. But the economic orthodoxy of the day has changed. And in recent decades, we have increasingly relied on private industry to provide all of our medications. And I think we're starting to see some of the cracks in that system now. Why have we done that? We presumably meaning the US government's policies done that. Uh, why move away from having a handful of companies plus the government actor to just having private companies? Well, I don't, I don't read minds and I'm not in the federal government, so I, I can't speak from that point of view. But as I said, the, the prevailing ethic, economic orthodoxy of the day has clearly changed, right? In the last few decades, particularly since the 70s, uh, it, the ideas about a free market and you know what makes 
the best kind of economy and provides the best goods and what makes a society rich and functional, right? Those, those ideas have changed. And we've seen a pattern in ownership of pharmaceuticals across the, the world, right? There were a lot of highly regarded public labs in Australia, in Argentina, in Canada, in the United States that all suffered a similar fate, which is privatization in the 70s, 80s, 90s, because our ideas as a society changed about, you know, how do we best get products to market? So for instance, uh, an example that I often go to is Conigate Labs in Canada, um, which is a publicly was a publicly owned lab affiliated with the University of Toronto. That's where insulin was first developed as a medicine, right, to treat diabetes, a life-saving medicine that, you know, brought us as a society from a place where kids with type 1 diabetes just died, where there was nothing you could do. They just died, right? And now we're at a place where type 1 diabetics, if they have access to their insulin, can live long and productive, healthy lives. So Conigate Labs, this public lab, developed insulin as a drug, manufactured it, and gave it to the world. Um, but it was privatized in that same wave of privatization that claimed a lot of the United States' public labs. So is this a trend that is similar across the world, or is the United States uniquely bad in this regard? Or what? How do, are there countries that are doing what ought to be done, that are doing a much better job uh, of investing in pharmaceuticals? Sure. As I said, there is definitely a, a trend that is global and what you know leaned toward privatization in certain decades and claimed a lot of these existing public labs. Nevertheless, there are still countries today that do a lot more public art research and development and production and distribution of essential medicines. Um, places like India and Brazil are real standouts there, but Thailand, China, the UK, on different scales, a lot of countries do it because there's just need, right? There's a recogni recognition that the private industry isn't going to produce everything that we need as a society. If you study health economics, you learn that the healthcare sector and pharmaceuticals are part of that, are, is really, really prone to market failure. So even if you're a market a, a enthusiast, right? Even if you believe that the free market is the only way to do things, the caveat is always that healthcare is going to tend to fail, right? It tends toward monopolies. It has huge externalities, right? Which is a a um a for instance a, 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 a sorry, <laughs> not doing my best here, but a, for instance, vaccines, right? One person or two people take a vaccine, it's good for a lot of other people because it provides societal protection. That's a positive externality. Goods that have these externalities tend to produce market failures because the incentives that we're used to in terms of, I am gonna buy something because it benefits me because I get utility out of it, that break breaks down when you have these broader societal incentives around them. So pharmaceuticals are really prone to market failures. And a lot of countries just recognize that and say, okay, we're gonna produce certain pharmaceuticals on our own in the public sector because we know the private sector is gonna fail here. And the US has just tried, I think, over the last few decades to insist, no, we can do it all through the private market. We can do it all through the private market. But we're seeing again and again, you know, patients can't afford their insulin. We're not getting new antibiotics, even though we need them. We're having recurring shortages. We have an awful lot of drugs that we don't need on the market that we pay a lot of money for because they make profit. So there's a lot of these problems that we're seeing with a solely market focused drug supply. And I think that's why we're seeing states step up and say, hey, we're going to make insulin ourselves. We're going to make naloxone. We're going to make anything that people need. So states are doing that. And is that the, the answer or is federal action required? And is anyone considering it? Sure. I, I think there are several potential answers here that the public sector can play a role in at various different levels. Um, I think 
both the United States and other countries around the world have shown that there's a lot of different ways to organize this, right? You can have federal labs doing research and states manufacturing drugs. You could do it vice versa. There's a whole bunch of different possibilities there. But I think in the absence of transformative federal action in recent years, states are really starting to step up. Um, the most prominent of those right now is California, which has not only already announced and passed legislation, but has appropriated funds to start making insulin and distributing that from the public sector. They've also announced that they're going to make naloxone and that they are looking into other medications. That the, Their plan was never just to make one drug, but to really attack the problem of high prices and recurring shortages and access issues by leveraging the power of the public sector uh, and recognizing the fact that because there's no profit motivation, there's a lot of freedom there. You can organize this however you need. You can organize an entity to meet societal goals rather than shareholder goals, right? Which means you can put patients on the board. You can be transparent about the prices you pay, right? You can do a lot of things. You can employ people in the public sector and give them good union jobs that are stable over time. You can bring manufacturing back to the United States, which I think both Republicans and Democrats generally support. So there's a lot of things you can do with the power of the public sector that I think states like California and others are getting excited about. There, there has been talk at federal level as well. Um, there's a bill that uh, Senator Warren and Representative Schakowsky have introduced a few times, and I believe they're going to reintroduce this fall. Uh, that would empower the federal government to manufacture drugs that are in shortage or that have access issues due to price. Um, so hopefully that will, you know, reignite this discussion. But I think a lot of states are also going to continue to step up as they see California be successful and provide something that their citizens need. We are speaking with Dana Brown, who is the Director of Health and Economy at the Democracy Collaborative, and we will have a link to her article up at talkworldradio.org. The, the federal government did recently make an announcement somewhat related to this that seemed, at least on the surface, a positive thing. They're actually going to bother to negotiate the prices of 10 drugs. Uh, presumably, that's a very small number of the existing drugs, uh, albeit something I keep hearing about as a transformative victory for the forces of good in the world. Uh, what good will that do? Is that a step in the right direction? Sure. I, I think it's undeniably a good thing, right? The federal government should always have had the, the power to negotiate drug prices like most governments uh, do and like various parts of the U.S. government you know, always have, right? Veterans Affairs has always uh, negotiated its prices on drugs, but we've left out Medicare and Medicaid and said, like, yeah, those people could just pay whatever the market wants, right? So absolutely, we should have the power to negotiate those prices. Absolutely, I think there'll be a positive effect for the overall economy and particularly for patients who take those drugs. I think it's a step in the right direction. And the great thing is it's not mutually exclusive with what we're proposing. And really, I want to underline here, part of what excites me so much about the idea of public pharma, and that is the public sector actually doing, right, making medications, pr producing new discoveries and bringing new drugs to market, distributing drugs to people who need them. Part of what's so exciting about that is once private pharmaceuticals aren't the only game in town, once there's competition from the public sector, that necessarily changes the balance of power. So if you're going to go to the negotiating table with the private pharmaceutical companies and ask them to lower their prices, you have a lot more leverage when you can also just manufacture the thing that they make, right? And we've seen that happen in the past. Thailand and Brazil, for instance, who have public manufacturing capacity and make certain drugs in the public sector, when they were negotiating prices early in the AIDS epidemic, on the uh, antiretrovirals, right? It was a, a, a big pharma companies were saying, we're the only game in town. We're the only people who make antiretrovirals. You have to pay this much, even though you have lots of people dying from this horrible disease. They said, we don't really have to pay that much because we can't afford that. And if you don't bring your price drastically down, we'll just make it ourselves. And so big pharma said, oh, oh we'll bring our price drastically down. Okay, right? We don't have that kind of leverage in the United States because we don't currently have federal manufacturing capacity that we make drugs in, but we could, and it would really change the conversation, right? Both in these negotiations 
and on other issues. There's a, you know, for a long time, lawmakers have wanted more transparency about why do we have to pay so much for these drugs? Where is the money going? Is it the insurers? Is it these, these pharmacy benefit managers? Is it the initial ingredients? Is it the wholesalers? Who's taking all the money? No, those are trade secrets. If the public sector is making it, the public sector is entering into contracts at all of those phases. We could publish those contracts and suddenly everyone would know how much does a wholesaler charge? How much do the initial ingredients cost? So we can force competition and transparency by doing, by entering into the game. And I think that's the really exciting thing here that could complement stuff that's already happening in Washington and around the country. So there are a number of benefits uh, to having the public sector do it, but I, I'm curious, in theory, the private sector is supposed to have competition in it, uh, you know, is an, is an alternative approach to stop allowing giant monopolies in this sector as in every other one. Uh, if you were to have, if you were to enforce the rule that there must be competition in the private sector, uh, is that an alternative? Theoretically, um, I would say that we've tried and failed on that front a lot of times. And I, I think not only in pharmaceuticals, but in a lot of sectors, antitrust law is good, but has its limits in practicality in the sense that even when we do take those steps to break up monopolies, they tend to reconsolidate over time. We saw that in banks, we saw that in energy, we saw that in telecom, right? And I think we just can't afford to play that game when people's lives are on the line. Literally, we're talking about medicines, we're talking about life and death, but we're also talking about a huge chunk of the economy. We're talking about keeping people healthy enough to be in the workforce, to be productive, right? It has so many ramifications for public life. Not only do I think that, you know, people in the richest country in the history of the world and in what's supposed to be a thriving democracy deserve to live well, but it's literally also just good for the economy to keep people healthy enough that they can participate in society, go out to restaurants, go to the theater, spend money, be productive, go to school, right? It's good for everybody to keep people healthy. So there are a lot of incentives here to make pharmaceuticals more accessible. And I think public pharma is just a tool in the toolkit that we shouldn't discount. Um, and it's worked in the past, yeah. even for us in the United States, right? Even in a very free market focused economy. I, I have an annoying habit of pointing out that per capita, the United States simply is not the wealthiest country in the world. We just say it is, but that's another show. H how, how have these policies played out in terms of addressing COVID uh, and how might they have impacted uh, that for the better? You, you mean the reliance entirely on the on private companies? Yes. Yeah, COVID is a very interesting example because we actually did see the public ste sector step up in a lot of ways, right? There was a huge amount of public funding that was released, right? There were public incentives, there were public partnerships, uh, you know, at a scale that we hadn't seen in a long time. And I think that's very important to recognize. I also think a very important example here is the NIH Moderna vaccine. So in many ways, what appears to be the most effective of all of these new generation of mRNA vaccines was developed hand in hand between the National Institutes of Health, a public entity, right, a national public lab, and Moderna, a private company. Um, and there's ongoing litigation here about who owns the patents and whether the people, the public, all of us are co-owners of that invention because NIH scientists really worked with Moderna every step of that process and actually taught Moderna how to bring a product to market because Moderna had never made anything before that came all the way to market. So, and the NIH actually helped them with the process of getting FDA approval and doing these trials and everything. Um, and the lawyers who've seen all of those documents can speak very clearly about the role that the US government and the people played and the fact that this is really our vaccine. So, you know, I, I think we've got a model where at the moment, the country in, in many ways is happy to just give that to Moderna and say, thank you so much, Moderna, for bringing this vaccine to market. But that's not the full story. Um, and I think there are lessons there that we can learn about how powerful our public sector is and how much 
knowledge and experience there is in institutions like the NIH that we could wield in a different way. We could say anything that's developed with all this public sector help and money needs to be in the public domain. You can't make a profit of, on it or we'll distribute it for free because it's essential to human life. Um, and like I say, other countries do this. The United States even does this and has done this on different scales over history. The state of Massachusetts makes a lot of vaccines and uh, immunotherapies in the public sector in a lab called Mass Biologics and for decades has distributed their uh, tetanus diphtheria vaccine for free within Massachusetts and at nonprofit prices around the country. Um, there are a lot of these models, and I think we've just forgotten that we know how to do this as a country. So there is legislation, there are states taking action, and there's legislation that's been introduced, I don't know how many times, in both houses. You said earlier, Dana Brown, that, that we can't read the minds of politicians, but we can read the campaign funding reports. Uh, I mean, uh, what are we up against here in terms of the interests and the financial power of, of the private companies? Uh, a lot. And I, I get so overwhelmed by large numbers that they don't mean anything to me. So I can't tell you exactly how big the pharmaceutical lobby is right now, because that number is nonsense to me. But obviously, they are very, very powerful industry and a lobby, a powerful lobby that spends a lot of money. I, I think that clearly makes a difference here. But as I said, I think that once the public sector at any scale starts doing a little more here, that starts to shift the balance of power. So I think once California has actually brought those insulins to market in the public sector, once they're producing public naloxone and distributing it across the state, once they're investigating the next eight drugs that they're going to bring to market, that starts to shift the conversation and it starts to erode big pharma's power and it starts to kind of take the the you know costume off right this idea that big pharma has been selling us for a long time which is you can't do this without us don't rub us the wrong way or we just won't make drugs you know you're not going to have your next discovery you guys are all going to die of cancer because we're just going to stop working i think that that facade starts to fade away once the public sector is doing more in different states and once patients are buying publicly produced insulin and taking it at home and living longer because of it. You know, in, in many areas, uh, including single payer health coverage, uh, the federal government has taken steps to prevent states uh, from doing the, the sensible thing. Um, uh, I, I'm hopeful. I hope I'm not giving anyone any ideas here, and I'm hoping that the federal government does not block states from taking action uh, in this sector. But uh, I guess I have a couple questions. Isn't single payer part of what we need? Uh, and is state action uh, the way to go? Is that going to be sufficient or is that going to drive federal action? Well, again, I, I think the great thing here is that, you know, these proposals aren't mutually exclusive. I actually think they're mutually beneficial. I think publicly producing more medications and bringing down those prices actually helps us achieve and keep single payer because it makes it more economical. It makes it more efficient. Um, yeah. I think it opens up a whole lot of possibilities for public public partnerships and again, more public sector jobs that benefit the economy that uh, employ more women and people of color than the private sector, right? I think there are a lot of co-benefits towards going down that road, particularly in healthcare, and taking more public sector responsibility and control over providing the things that we need to sustain human life. Um, and the great thing, you know, I, I again, I can't read minds. I don't know what some, you know, folks in DC might be thinking about in terms of preventing states from making essential medicines. But the great thing is there are precedents here. As I said, the state of Massachusetts is making publicly produced medicines right now. And the state of Michigan used to. And the city of New York through the public health department used to, as did many other health departments around. We've shown legally, financially, politically, a, you, know, you can do this in the United States and several you know, more states are coming online that are just going to be doing it as well. Um, even you know, deep red states like Texas has publicly owned a research and development infrastructure that looks into new cures for cancer. So I, I think this is actually a place where you could get some bipartisan consent that 
it's just a pragmatic thing to do. Um, it, it was Republicans in Utah that talked about using the state essentially as a pharmacy benefit manager to negotiate and bring down prices on insulin. It's a fiscally conservative thing to do. We're getting ripped off here, guys. I want to spend public funds in different ways. Uh, so I'm just going to solve this problem. I, I think there really is political space, and I think states see it more than the feds do at this moment. And I think they're going to act, and that's just going to start to slowly change the conversation. Let's hope so. Uh, I want to ask a couple questions that we have uh, three or four minutes left. Uh, what can people do to advance this agenda? And can you tell us about the Democracy Collaborative, uh, who you are and, and what else you work on? Sure. So the Democracy Collaborative is a think and do tank, and we try to be an R&D lab for a new economy that is more sustainable and equitable by design. And this idea of ownership, right, who owns the institutions of our, our economy is really central to what we do. So this work on pharmaceuticals and on the healthcare sector as a whole is really a big part of that. It's you know, who gets to make decisions in our economy and how can we empower more people to be a part of that? Um, so I, I think in terms of public pharma or any of these related issues, people can talk about it more. People can call their representative and say, hey, you know, I heard California is going to be making insulin and, and distributing it at, at cost or, you know, really low cost to patients. Can, can we do that? Are there drugs that we should be doing? Uh, can you buy some of that low cost insulin from California and distribute it here? <laughs> what what can we be making that we as a society need? I think just starting to have those conversations is really important because as I say, we actually have a deep tradition of doing this as a country, but we kind of forgotten because we've been told by the folks with a lot of money that there's only one way to do it, right? So I, I think we really just need to challenge that narrative as a society and empower politicians to do the right thing here. Very good idea. Very well said. I hope people can get to work on it. Uh, we have been speaking with Dana Brown, who is the Director of Health and Economy at the Democracy Collaborative. We'll have a link to that up at talkworldradio.org and to her recently co-authored article, Public Pharma is the Best Solution to the Ongoing Problem of Drug Shortages. Dana Brown, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.